Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study, and we're going to continue looking at Daniel chapter 11, uh, verse 14. Uh, but before we begin, can you join me in a word? The dear Father in heaven, we are grateful for all the things you show us in your word and thankful for the time that we have each morning to open your word and to discover light for the day. And we know, Lord, that there's much that we need to learn. So we give our hearts to you and ask that you can work in our lives and that you can use us to your glory. Be with us in the study of present truth. Um, as the events of the world uh, around us can only be understood by dependence upon your word. And so we invite your spirit that inspired the writers of the scriptures to speak to our hearts now. We pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning again, everyone. And um, we left off in Daniel 11, verse 14. Um, but before we go there, I just want to read some comments that were made. So um, on the previous day, there was uh, a comment um, which is translated from Romanian into English. And um, so, so there's language barrier with his brother. But he says, I don't want to criticize anyone anymore, but I really laugh at how amazing the human mind is. After you have hardly accepted Chao Tu's opinion that one of his princes was referring to Ptolemy and Seleucus, uh, now you turn back again saying that until his fortress does not refer to the king of the south, but the king of the north. Is it good or bad? I do not know. Give it a go now, and we'll see where it ends and who will be and who you'll be left with. Because what can God stop doing if we don't understand his will? So you can see, of course, translating from Romanian into English isn't always that easy. Um, so then I, I said, well, we are learning. I, ex I examine everything and then we make decisions based upon Miller's rules. The idea that it is the fortress of the king of the north has to do with the parallel expressions in verses 9 and 10. So the king of the south shall come into his kingdom and shall return into his own land. But his sons shall be stirred up and shall assemble a multitude of great forces, and one shall certainly come and overflow and pass through. Then shall he return and be stirred up even to his fortress. So we can see, based on paralleling these two verses, the idea is that he returns to his own fortress, not to the fortress of the king of the south. Right? <clears throat> and then he replies, um, However, it is strange to me that if I apply the, this reasoning to Raphia's internal line, our history seems to confirm your grammatical understanding. Parminder, king of the south, did exactly as Antiochus Magnus did in the conflict with Pippinger and pushed him to his fortress, the king of the north to his fortress. Now, we do talk about internal and external lines. And when we were dealing with Parminder, uh, Parminder's movement, we could see that it's a type of what's going to happen uh, to the church on the larger line. So we can say that that what we were looking at with Parminder's movement, if we're going to classify him as, as king of the south and Jeff Pippinger's FFA as the king of the north, um, then we can say, well, we see that internally within the church as well. Now, I don't want to go too into do too deep, too much depth regarding this. I mean, to say that Arminder is the king of the south, there's definitely parallels there. Um, but we haven't looked at like how do we apply the king of the south, the king of the north, uh, you know, consistently within that line, that internal line. I think we just see a parallel and we can say there's an internal line. We see uh, the king of the, the south comes. He defeats the king of the north, so to speak. Arminder comes for a little bit. He takes, uh, there's many ten thousands that are slain, right, that are taken. And, and then Jeff comes um, and responds to that. Um, 
you know, with the message regarding July 18th. So you have the message of November 9th, that's Rafia, the measure of uh, the date of July 18th, that's Panium. And that's an internal line just in this conflict between these two parties, right? Um, but, you know, are we going to parallel the Greek kingdom to this movement? There's lots of problems if you try to um, you try to make that a complete line. You can see these parallels. But one of the things that we have to do with each line is we, we need to recognize, and what we did with, with Parmenders is we looked at the book of Judges, and we could see that that was Sisera. Right. So we had all of this very uh, clear parallels that we could place on a line properly. Um, <clears throat> but it is interesting to say, well, on one hand, you know, we see that now it says pushed him to his fortress. I don't think that that's what happens with the Battle of Paneum. He just returns to his fortress because he has defeated uh, the king of the south. So. So anyway, I just wanted to address these things just so people could think about them a little bit. And maybe they have some relevance to what we're doing. Okay, so getting back to this. Um, so after the Battle of Paneum, which we're saying is the midnight cry, and that's the midnight cry on the big line. Um, we have uh, in verse 14, it says, in those times there shall... There shall many, and many being Philip, king of Macedon, and Antiochus the third, stand up and make war against the king of the south. So that's going to be Ptolemy the fourth. And then we discussed about the robbers of thy people. So the robbers of thy people need to be Rome, which in our time would be the papacy, shall exalt themselves come into history, right? So we're saying that this is, they're going to join in this threefold union at the Sunday law so that we can see Raphia is midnight, Benim's the, uh, the midnight cry, and then this verse, verse 14, is referring to this Sunday law to establish the vision. Now, we look at the vision. The vision is the Chazon from 723 BC to 1798, representing the two desolating powers, and we haven't put exactly what that represents in our line. And then, but they shall fall. Now, if you believe, as Swearingen did, regarding uh, that uh, it's not that Rome comes, exalts themselves to establish the vision, but this is referring to Atticus Epiphanes. Um. then um, it, it wouldn't make sense to say the Seleucid Syrian Empire, Empire would collapse by 64, 63 BC because the empire that's collapsing then is, is not the one that's, that, um, that exalts itself, right? If one exalts itself as Rome, you, you wouldn't put the they shall fall unless you're going to have the they refer to something else previous right so we have to decide how to do this so hopefully people spent a bit of time thinking about it so let's take a look at this again let's just look at this verse just in its historic application so in those times there shall many stand up against the king of the south so so this makes sense we have philip king of macedon and Antiochus standing up, and what they're doing is they're, uh, what are they doing exactly? They're partitioning a part of the, uh, to the Telemic Empire, correct? Is it not, uh, when the king of the south was that uh, five year old, uh, Son? Yeah, so he's going to be um, uh, yeah, he's going to be this this child, right? So there, you're going to have another one who's going to be young as well. So I get confused. 
um, between these these different uh, people, especially since they all have the same name, uh, Ptolemy. Um, so let me see here. I'm going to find this. Uh, why am I having trouble finding this? Okay, so um, so this is, I'm just going to read a paragraph here from Swearingen. Uh, I'm not going to sh- change the screen because it's just a little bit. Uh, These victories by Antiochus III were so decisive that Egyptian naval presence in the Mediterranean had been neutralized. So this is um, uh, referring to uh, the Fourth Syrian War, right? Um, So Ptolemy, the um, let me see here. This costly hesitation on his part coupled the distraction of an internal rebellion in the east by a disloyal satrap in Babylon who would delay Antiochus's Attention on Egypt long enough to give the successor to Ptolemy III, that is Ptolemy IV, Philopater, who reigned from 221 to 203, the necessary time needed to regroup and assemble a powerful army, right? So this is going to then be um, uh, the Battle of Raphia. So you have the Battle of Raphia that occurs and then the king of the north shall return and set forth a multitude greater than former. That's the Battle of Paneum, right? So, um, so it's Ptolemy V uh, presented an ample opportunity to seek revenge for his defeat at Raphia um, by starting the Fifth Syrian War. So if we look at these charts here, so, so I always get confused, but let's try this here. So I have here these different Ptolemies, right? So we have um, Ptolemy the Fourth Philopater, and you're going to have this uh, period of time here where uh, Antiochus and Seleucus are going to be dividing the kingdom, but it's mostly going to be, or uh, pardon me, Antiochus the Third and um, the other guy, the Macedonian guy. Um, so where is this here? King of Macedon, right? So they're going to stand up against the king of the south. So they're going to be partition, partitioning. So this is the guy who comes to the throne when he's like five years old, right? Of course, he's not going to be five years old this time. And then what they say here, according to Swearingen, when he says, also the robbers of thy people, he's going to make this Antiochus the fourth. Right. So he's going to have this happening between um, uh, later on. Right. So. We go back again to this chart. So you're going to see uh, once you get uh, Ptolemy the fourth here and Tychus the third he's also going to come against his successor, Ptolemy the fifth. Right. But they're going to bring you up. Swearingen's going to bring you all the way up to Antiochus Epiphanes. So he's going to deal with the fifth and the sixth. But we don't see that that occurs. Right. So we don't see that we get to that history. Now, um, so Antiochus the third, his reign is going to end in 187. Right. So we have that symbol of 187. And for us, when we look at this, this, these events, um, we're going to see Antiochus the fourth. Uh, so that's going to be Antiochus Epiphany. So we're going to have to address this. We're going to have to figure this out, all of this part, but I haven't figured it out yet. So all I know is that here we have to have Rome exalting itself to establish the vision and Rome does that by restricting um, the king of Macedon and Antiochus III from uh, coming against Egypt itself, right? So even though they partition some of the Ptolemic Empire's territories, they don't come and uh, against Egypt because of Rome, right? Is that is that correct? Am I saying this correctly? Anybody who knows this history? 
<clears throat> so Rome needs to come in to establish the vision. And, and that vision is the Chazon from 723 to 1798. So without Rome, that vision is not established. We need to have Rome. It completes that picture of Daniel's prophecies and, and all the other ones that deal with this, the daily and the transgression of desolation. Rome comes in to do that. So when it says, but they shall fall, who is the they? Is it not uh, everyone who came up against the king of the south? Okay, so I didn't quite catch that. So the they is who? The league, which was made against the king of the south. Okay, I still didn't catch that. Who Just say, who is they? Is it the king of the south or the king of the north? Who is the they? They, it's them who came up against the king of the south. Yeah, so you're saying that's... You're king saying the it's north? Uh, Philip, Philip of Macedon and Tychus III. So the they yes. is referring to the king of the north and Philip of Macedon. Okay. Yes. Okay, so so if that's the case, we could apply this to the Seleucid Syrian Empire, but it would also have to refer to Macedon as well, right? So so if we're if we're gonna if we're gonna say the they because the they is a plural, right? It's not a singular, <clears throat> and and this is is part of the problem with this with the interpretation of swearing it. Because when it says, also the robbers of thy people, they uh, shall exalt themselves. Now, if the robbers of thy people are um, Antiochus IV, does it make sense? I mean, you could say that this is, well, Greece um, comes, right, through, that is the northern kingdom of Greece, comes through, uh, Antiochus the fourth and exalts himself. That's that's the way swearing didn't would say. But here, when it says they, the robbers of thy people, it doesn't appear to be referring to one of the kings of the north or the king, you know, the kings of the south. It's not. It's not saying the king of the north and the king of the south come against you, right? Because the king of the south really is is not going to come into Palestine again, right? In this history. So it's its work is as far as conquering Palestine is has ended, right? That's the king of the north that now has uh, hollow Syria. So so we're saying it's Rome, and they exalt themselves, and they do this to establish the chazon. So this is something that we've understood, but we really want to establish now this to establishing this vision. Um. If we put this into our history, uh, we're saying that this has to do with the joining of the two sticks in some way. And, and the idea of the joining of the two sticks is um, this is uh, uh, the Protestants joining with Seventh-day Adventists to stand against the Sunday law, right? So this is something that happens, um, well, between midnight and the midnight cry, it begins. Um, but when the papacy steps it in, this is, um, we, we could say, um, to establish the vision, we could even just say it's the image of the beast. So the image of the beast is formed, we could say, causing. So when the image of the beast is formed, this causes the two sticks to join. Okay? Because Protestants begin to recognize what's happening. 
that the enemy of Rome, the enemy, which is Rome, the papacy, is, is, um, this threefold union is occurring. The image of the beast is being made. Right? Um, so they exalt themselves. Now, we could maybe even put, you know, join at the threefold union of the Sunday law. We could say just the image of the beast is formed there as well. But, but the whole idea is that this history, this exalting of themselves, of the robbers, of thy people, of Rome, of the papacy, a lot of things happen in connection with that. The image of the beast is formed, and it's going to be this threefold union, uh, which produces the Sunday law. But also we have the joining of the two sticks. So if we say, but they shall fall, if we're saying that the Seleucid Syrian Empire wouldn't be what falls, it would be Philip, King of Macedon and Antiochus III. If we're saying that they refers to them, um, then they would fall somewhere you know, I don't know if I'd put it 64, 63, but you would put it at somewhere when Rome conquers those territories. But also the they could refer to the papacy itself. So, um, so the papacy, but they shall fall, that is Rome. And, and if we're, we're putting the papacy here in, if we're putting the chazon here, wouldn't this bring us to the captivity of the Pope in 1798? I don't know if that, that makes sense to people that we're gonna, we're gonna say that Rome shall fall, but it's not just pagan Rome. It's also referring to pag, pag, papal Rome. Because to establish this vision, this vision is Ending in 1798. So, I mean, we could put the fall of Rome in whatever it is, uh, 496. No, it's not 496. When do, when do we have Rome fall? What's the date? Four something. <clears throat> Any thoughts on this before we, we sort of put something in here? Because I don't think the day is referring to Macedon and Antiochus III, the king of Macedon, Philip. Well, then we would have to uh, <laughs> go to Revelation 13.10, where it says, if, if you're talking about the Pope falling, right? He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity, etc. Yeah, okay. So if we put they shall fall, that is, the robbers of thy people shall fall. The robbers of thy people, well, we would say, first say that's pagan Rome, right? So, I mean, we could just say it's the fall of pagan Rome. Right. So when, when does Rome fall? What's the date? I always forget this one. Well, I... So we have a fall. What, what's the, like, the secular date for the fall of Rome, of the Western Roman Empire? I'm gonna to have to look it up, I guess. So we we know that it occurred in 476, and you're looking for that. That's what I'm looking for. Just that date, the fall of the Western Roman Empire. Yeah, 476. Okay. So so we could put just um you know 476 AD. So so that that would be referring to the fall of Rome, right? So that would be pagan Rome. And so that's possible. Rome exalts itself to establish the vision. This vision is going to go to 1798, right? But there are two desolating powers there. There's paganism and papalism. Um, now, so we could just put 476, but we could put 476 for pagan Rome and 1798 for papal Rome. Oops, I put Rome in there. Yeah, 
Okay. So, so we could put both. It could be referring to they shall fall, because this is the fourth kingdom, right? The fourth kingdom of Bible prophecy, Rome. Now, Rome still continues in another form. That is, once you get to Rome, you have pagan Rome, you have papal Rome, and then you have the United States, and then you have the UN. And these are all, in a sense, Rome. I mean, the United States has modeled itself after Rome, its government, after the idea of a republic, a Roman republic. Okay, so so we have have that, and then and then the UN is is a model of of Rome, but also a Babylon, right? So it's all these kingdoms of the, this world. <clears throat> So when we make uh, an application to our time, um, we would just simply say that this rise of this power after the joining of the two sticks and the Sunday law, I mean, it's going to fall, you know, with the close of probation and the seven last plagues. So any thought? On, on this idea, this parallel. Is there any other way we should say this or things that we should understand about this? <clears throat> is this a date or is this a period? Well, it's a period. I mean, we have the Sunday law at the close of probation. We have, um, you know, let him that is just be unjust still. Let him that is uh, righteous be righteous still, right? So you have this close of probation. But there is this period of time. We know that uh, Satan's personation of Christ occurs during the seven last plagues. And the seven last plagues, in a sense, are also their own line, a repeat of history, right? But in a, in a different context, right? right at the end of the world. So you, you sense have a time in the end at the close of probation as well. Right. So you have the close of the Day of Atonement and all the things attached to that. So <clears throat> but we're just going to say in this line, in our line, we have the close of probation, the seven last plagues. You have all of those events, you know, Jesus coming. That is all the end of that's when they fall. The Rome arising in our time. Coming in at this, so the papacy coming in at our time, it's going to fall in that history. So it's not really a specific date, just a period of time in which it falls. So the main thing here is we have a complete line, right? So when we go through and um, we look at this history, that that is, we have the history of from 1798, uh, or, no, pardon me, uh, um, from 1989. So we have our line, the time of the end from 1989 to the close of probation. This is the line that Jeff had, right? 1989, Sunday law, close of probation. That's the line. And, and when we look at this line and we take Greece, Greece is now addressing this line. But in this line of Greece, we're going to see that uh, we have the king of the north and the king of the south developing. Right. But what comes in is Rome. They come in to establish the vision. And so Rome comes here at the end of the line of Greece to, to bring about the end of this line, right? So you have the three powers. You have the king of the north, the king of the south, and the papacy. This, this interpretation of Greece as applying to our line gives us our entire line. But Rome comes in at the end to establish the vision because you need Rome there at the Sunday law. Now, 
We're going to have then a repeat of history when we deal with Rome. Um, and, and we have much different interpretation then of what's happening here in verse 15. So we still got to get to verse 15. Then how Swearingen looks at it, right? So he's going to have a little bit different history here. So we're going to have to deal with verse 15 as well. But it's just saying there's this Sunday law, and it says this Rome that comes in to establish the vision of the Sunday law, it's going to fall. And it's looking to the future, right? That is, in their this history, it's going to look to the Kazon, right? Because it's going to establish the vision. This is something way in the future. But when it's in, when it, they fall, it's going to be referring to pagan and papal Rome falling. Okay, so so that's the history, the historic application. They shall fall. This is not about uh, um, Philip, king of Macedon, and Antiochus the third falling. This is about the papacy, the one that exalts themselves to establish the vision. So Swearingen has that as Antiochus the fourth. So so the next verse, what Swearingen has in there, doesn't make any sense in the context of how we looked at um, Rome coming in. Now, it, there's going to be some things that we have to sort out here. Maybe, you know, maybe we could apply this history here like he does. So maybe we can. Um, but uh, is that making sense to people, what I'm saying about this parallel between that history and having to interpret it this way, that they shall fall is pagan and papal Rome, and that this applies to our history through the close of pro probation and the seven last plagues. So we can see how Rome needs to come there to complete this picture. So I'm not sure about verse 15 yet, but we're going to look at it. But just so far, verse 14. Any any thoughts on that? Is it making sense? There are some points as you're t as we've been looking at this. It's just it, it's kind of interesting that during the time frame leading up to 476, mm -hmm. there were several events that occurred that are eerily similar to what we're looking at and what we've been experiencing over these last several years. Well, you're dealing with things like 321 and stuff like that? Or? I'm looking at a time period like the that had some decisive turn of events that brought the Roman Empire to its knees. I mean, when you're when you're looking at this, you've got the Antonine Plague. You have a what was called the Crisis of the Third Century, that had what they claimed to be climate change, a pandemic disease, okay, an internal and external political instability. Okay. Well, and we we we'll have to look at that when we look at Rome more closely, but. Sure. Yeah. But here, all we're saying is that Rome comes in to establish the vision. And then, but they shall fall is not referring to the Greek Empire or any aspect of it or Macedon, but to this, the robbers of thy people that exalt themselves to establish the vision. And it's because we have the zone there that we say, well, this connects us to that history the falling there is referring to uh, that history itself okay not um right and the and the word fall is totter and waver right so like through weakness of the legs especially the ankle so does that sort of help establish that this is the image of Daniel chapter two.
does to me. Yeah. Yeah. So so I think that that helps us establish that this is wrong. It's the one that has the weakness in the legs, especially the ankle. Well, we would say here the ankle, right? That's you're going to have uh, the iron mingled with clay. And and it's it means to be decayed. Right. Also cast down, ruin, overthrown, utterly. Right. So so this applies very well to Rome. <clears throat> OK. So now when we I, I just want to read over what Uriah Smith has written about this. Right. So I have it here uh, just dealing with um, the Romans. So first, you know, he's going to talk about. um Right. So you're going to have um, Philip of Macedon. Right. So they're going to be involved in what happens with coming against Ptolemy IV. But here, um, when it talks about uh, to establish the vision, the Romans, more than any other people, are the subject of Daniel's prophecy. The first interference in the affairs of these kingdoms is here referred to as being the establishment or demonstration of the truth of the vision which predicted the existence of such power. Um, but they shall fall, is referred to by some to mention the first part of the verse, who should stand up against the king of the south. Others, to the robbers of Daniel's people, the Romans. It is true in either case. If those who combined against Ptolemy are referred to, all that need be said is that they simply did, sim did speedily fall. If it applies to the Romans, the prophecy simply pointed to the period of their final overthrow. Right. So establishing the vision, we have to say is wrong, um, but that, that they shall fall. To me, the best explanation is that this is wrong. So differences of opinion, he says either case, it's going to work historically. But I think I think to say that it refers to Rome because of the word Kazon and even the idea of fall because of the weakness of the ankles uh, would refer to Rome. So now when we get to verse 15, I'm going to read uh, what Uriah Smith says about verse 15. <clears throat> so the king of the south, uh, the king of the north shall come, cast up a mount and take the most fenced cities and the arms of the south shall not withstand neither his chosen people, neither shall there be any strength to withstand. Um, so the education of the young king of Egypt was entrusted by the Roman Senate, Senate to don't know what M stands for, Emilius Lepidus, who appointed Aristomenes and an old and experienced minister of the court uh, to be his guardian. His first act was to provide against the threatened invasion of the two confederated kings, Philip and Antiochus. So you can see Rome is involved in protecting Egypt here. <clears throat> to this end, he dispatched Scopus, a famous general of Aetolia, then in the service of the Egyptians, into his native country and to raise reinforcements for the army. After equipping an army, he marched into Palestine and, and all of Syria, uh, Antiochus being engaged in war in Attalus with Lesser Asia, and reduced all Judea to the authority of Egypt. <clears throat> Thus, affairs were brought about for the fulfillment of the verse before us. Desisting from his war with Attalus and to the dictation of the Romans, Antiochus took speedy steps for the recovery of Palestine and cold Syria from the hands of the Egyptians. Scopus was sent to oppose him. Near the sources of the Jordan, the two armies met. Um, so this is Paneum, right? Is that where we're looking at? Is that the area there? Scopus was defeated, pursued to Sidon, and they are closely besieged. Three of the ablest generals of Egypt, with their best forces, were sent to raise the siege, but without success. At length, Scopus, meeting a foe in the specter of famine with which he was unable to cope, was forced to surrender to, on the dishonorable terms of life only. He and his 10,000 men were permitted to, de to depart stripped and destitute. Here was the taking of the most fenced cities by the king of the north. For Sidon was in its situation and defenses, one of the strongest cities of those times. 
Here was the failure of the arms of the South to withstand and the failure also of the people which the king of the South had chosen, namely Scopius and his Atelian Atelian forces. So here, Uriah Smith appears to be saying that this is just a continuation of the Battle of Panean, right? The, that is, this is the Battle of Panean. He doesn't say it is, right? But is that what he's saying? Is that the battle he's referring to? It would seem so. Yeah, that's what it seems like to me, because if they're meeting at the sources of the Jordan River, that would be Panea. So, so I'd often thought, you know, that Uriah Smith doesn't refer to the Battle of Panea, but here he is. Okay. It's just that it's, um, it's just he doesn't say Panea, right? Um, I'm just going to read something here. So, because this is the area that we call Caesarea Philippi, right? Um, so I'm just reading, it's, it's a thing here talking about, it's called the sources of the Jordan River. And it's referring here to these, this place. Yeah. So it says here, um, this is quoting something or whatever. It says, so Caesar bestowed his country from Herod. Uh, it contained Panias, that is Panium, and the country round about. So when he had conducted Caesar to the sea and was returned home, he built him a most beautiful temple of the whitest stone near a, the place called Panium. This is a very fine cave in the mountain. There's a picture here, which under which there is a great cavity in the earth. And the cavern is abrupt and prodigiously deep and still full of water. Over it hangs a vast mountain. And under the caverns arise the springs of the Jordan. Herod adorned this place, which was already a very remarkable one, still further by the erection of his temple, which was dedicated to Caesar. So the sources of the Jordan is the springs at Paneum. Okay, so that makes sense. We're, we're, we're agreed there. That all fits. So if we go back to our document that Swearingen has done, he's placing this much, much later, right? He's, he's not going to take verse 15 as referring to the Battle of Benium. He's going to have a tie kiss the fourth there. Right? So the king of the north can't be Antiochus the fourth. Right? We know that this is still going to be Antiochus the third. Okay? So, so we're not going to place this as them invading Egypt in 168, 169-168 BC. So we put this as 201, and this is going to be in Judah, right? And so this is going to be the Battle of Paneum, right? So the arms of the south, that's the Egyptian army, should not withstand. Paul pray to now that they're going to lose the Battle of Paneum, right? So this is a Syrian occupation of Judea, right? So they're not going to, they can't resist this, right? But we're going to say that this is not the Holy Spirit called Syria. Okay, so so we're just putting this as a different. Um, Yeah. Does that make sense? That's sort of what Uriah Smith says. Synoptically, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so we can see Rome is introduced because we're going to have this Sunday law. So, but we go back and 
address this battle of Paneum again. So, so we have the battle of Paneum in verse 13, but we have it in verse 15. So in this interpretation, whether this is correct or not, um, it's going to bring us back to this battle. Now, the question is why? Because we would say, well, it's going to talk about the Sunday law. And then it says, well, we're going to go back now to this battle of Paneum. And so why would they do that? Why would Daniel um, talk about the preparation for the battle? Right. And say, in those times, there shall many stand up against the king of the south. Right. So it's going to go. Um, it's going to talk about what happens previous to the battle of Paneum. Right. So we. So it's, it's addressing this period of time. And if we look at these kings here, right, we're going to have the battle of Paneum here. Um, in the time of Ptolemy Philopater, right? So I'm just trying to figure here. So it's going to be the end of his reign. We have Tychicus the third. They're going to be having this struggle over all of all of this um, territory of, of of Egypt, right? And then they're finally going to capture Judea, and that's going to be uh, in 200 BC. So when we get to 200 BC, that's going to be in the time of Ptolemy V, right? So the Battle of Paneum is going to be in the time of Ptolemy V. And when we look at our, our verse here, uh, if we're going to put in the arms of the South, the Egyptian army, army, under Ptolemy the fifth now, right? So Philopater's out of the way. Okay. So they divide that land, Matt, uh, the, the territory that's under uh, Philip of Macedon and Antiochus the third. Rome comes in to establish the vision. It's going to be. Um, Preparing, and how did, um, so when it says, um, let me see here, I've just got to read this a little bit better. I'm going to search this. Sorry about that. Just got to make sure I got this right. So when we deal with, uh, uh, so Ptolemy the fifth, He's going to be the one that comes in at the age of five. I think the other one was eight. So it's going to be Rome uh, coming in and interfering with uh, the education of Ptolemy V. Right? So when Uriah Smith talks about um, the education of the young king of Egypt was entrusted by the Roman Senate to... Emilius Lepidus, who was who appointed a, a Aristomenes, an old and experienced minister of the court, to be his guardian. His first act was to provide against the threatened invasion of the two Confederate kings, Philip and Antiochus. Right. So there is a threat. That threat is going to happen um, with the death of Philip, uh, the younger, right, the the fourth, uh, not Philip the fourth. Uh, Ptolemy the fourth, right? So Ptolemy the fourth, he's, he's gonna die. And Ptolemy the fifth is this five year old, uh, king of the south, right? And Rome is not wanting an invasion against Egypt. Doesn't want Egypt conquered because that's gonna threaten Rome. So, so we can see the parallel to our time. Right. We should be able to see that. So Rome comes in and establishes the vision. And this is going to be. Uh, in connection with this history. So they're they're going to during the time of Ptolemy, the fourth. 
They're not, they're, they're going to be opposing what's happening with the division of, of uh, the Telemic Empire. They're going to make sure that Egypt itself is not uh, going to be conquered by uh, Syria. And, and then when Ptolemy IV dies and Ptolemy V becomes king, Egypt, uh, Rome is still there, right? And then you're going to have the Battle of Panin. So, so Rome is still there at that time. But it's going to be involved in this Sunday law that's coming. Okay. So the king of the north, Antiochus the third. So I'm just going to get rid of this part of it. So Antiochus the third is going to come in, in 201 BC, right? Cast up a mount, take the most fenced cities of Judah. That's their um, military support, their their front line, so to speak, in the north. Um, And the arms of the south, that's the Egyptian army under Ptolemy V, shall not withstand. So they're going to have a battle there in Judea to take over that area. They're going to lose the Battle of Panin. And neither his chosen people, the Jewish people also, they can't resist the Syrian occupation of Judea. Neither shall there be any strength to withstand. So Seleucid Syria would dominate uh, hollow Syria and Judea under Antiochus III. <clears throat> so if we put this into our history, so the Battle of Panium is not the Sunday Law. Right. So we're saying that the Sunday law is represented because the the papacy comes in, Rome comes in. But in our time, the papacy. And so this becomes a defeat of. Atheistic communism. Right. And we had the defeat of atheistic communism. In 1989, the United States and the Pope combined. Now, when we, when we look at that history, we see, we can see a parallel there of the papacy coming in ahead of time to establish the vision. So, so we have another application of but when we just get into our line itself, we get to 1989 and we draw this out as our line. Um, it's going to introduce Rome at the end. It's going to refer to this Kazone. So in this case, the, that Kazone, 723 to 1798, representing paganism and, and, and papalism. This is then going to be paralleled in our history at the end. And they're going to fall, right? But then they go back to this battle of Paneum, right? That's the way Daniel describes this story. He talks about the setup of the battle of Paneum. He talks about Rome coming in to establish the vision. But then he addresses finally just the battle of Paneum, right? So this is going to be the battle of Paneum. It's not going to be the Sunday law. In verse 15. So if we're going to address this and make an application. um, And we've looked at the king of the north. So we say if we go back here. You know we have uh, Ptolemy the fourth. He's going to be you know this is atheistic communism. Right. Um, There's. This battle in the Battle of Raphia. And then we have the Battle of Paneum, the response, the build up to that response. Then this reference back to the dividing of the Greek Empire, or not the Greek, um, the Telemic Empire with, with Syria and Macedon. And then we have this reference to the papacy coming in to establish the vision, Rome establishing the vision. 
and then to the Battle of Panium itself. <clears throat> And so we're saying Antiochus III represents the United States. So the king of the north is the USA. Now, we have a date here, Balapanian, 321. But we know we, we don't have a date for that, per se, right? But we did, we did have some symbols there, and that was the certain years. And the certain, you know, 17 years and 46 days, if you add 360 to it, prophetic time, it becomes um, 18 years and uh, about um, 40 days. <clears throat> and you add that to uh, 8141 which is 22 years and 105 days. So you, you add those together, it's the whole span of time from November 9th, 1989 to April 5th, 2030. So I'm just going to put here April 5th, 2030. Now, again, I'm not setting this as a date that the Battle of Panium occurs. I'm just saying that this is a symbol that if we're going to put it on our line, represents the Battle of Panium, just as December 25th, 2021, represented the Sunday Law. We didn't have a Sunday Law, then, right? It was just a symbol. So, so that's why I'm saying, you know, putting April 5th, 2030, that comes from that calculation. 14,757 14, days from November 9th, 1989 to April 5th, 2030, which can be seen in that phrase, certain years in the Hebrew numbers. Okay. Now cast up amount. So what is this casting up amount and taking of the most fenced cities? So when we looked at uh, Uriah Smith's, um, dealing with this. Um, so to this end, he dispatched Scopius, the famous general of Anatolia, then the service of the Egyptians into his native country to raise reinforcements for the army. After equipping an army, he marched into Palestine and cold Syria, Antiochus being engaged in war in, with Talus in Lesser Asia and reduced all Judea to the authority of Egypt. Um, thus, affairs were brought about for the fulfillment of the verse before us, right? So he's talking about all that preparation of what had happened. So the Egyptians had, king of the south, right, had conquered Judea, right? So that's the battle of Raphia. That's, that's what it's dealing with, right? Dealing with Raphia, not the battle, but the results of Raphia. Thus affairs were brought about for the fulfillment of the verse before us, desisting from his war with Attalus at the dictation of the Romans. Antiochus took speedy steps for the recovery of Palestine and called Syria from the hands of the Egyptians. Scopus was sent to oppose him. Near the sources of the Jordan, the two armies met at Panium, right? Scopus was defeated, pursued to, pursued to Sidon, and there closely besieged. Three of the ablest generals of Egypt with their best forces were sent to raise the siege, but without success. At length, Scopus, meeting a foe in the specter of famine with which he was unable to cope, was forced to surrender on the dishonorable terms of life only. He and his 10,000 men were permitted to depart stripped and destitute. Here was the taking of the most fenced cities by the king of the north. For Sidon was, in its situation and defenses, one of the strongest cities of those times. Here was the failure of the arms of the south to withstand, and the failure also of the people, which the king of the south had chosen, namely, namely Scopus and his Aetolian forces. <clears throat> okay, so can we see that this is the battle of Paneum and the aftermath, and that Egypt, the king of the south, atheistic communism, loses in that battle? 
the king there just has his life, uh, or the general has his life uh, spared. Okay. Any thoughts on this? Not yet. Okay. So, I mean, I don't know if what I'm doing is correct or not. I'm just saying that this this is what what I'm suggesting. I'm just thinking here with some of these numbers. Okay, so what about um, this word here? Um, just going back to verse 14. In those times. So remember, you have that word times. That's also the one where it talks about certain years. So if we have that, that word times, 6256, right? That's 17 years and 46 days. Um, but it's also a symbol of prophetic time, 360. Um, what would that represent? What does it mean in those times or these times? There's so many stand up against the king of the south, right? So I'm doing a calculation here. I gotta think about that still a bit more. So we can connect this to our history through this symbol, right, of times. I would believe so. Let's try another calculation here. Okay. Um, I know how to do that, but um, so when we deal with this, these times, I'm going to just say that this is from September 11th um, to uh, and I'm taking the word times. So the word, uh, so let me see here. I'm just kind of show you what I'm doing. So if we take in those times or these times, um, the word here, I'm just trying to see which word this is. Uh, and yeah, I'll show you my screen here. <clears throat> right. So we have here in those times. So that's, 1992 is the, the number. Uh, for those, right, Haim or Haima, right, depending on, on the form. Um, and it says they used only when emphatic, right? So this is, so what does it mean when something's emphatic? It's, it has an emphasis, right? Like a strong statement. Correct. So, so in those times, so this is in an emphatic form, right? It's only used when emphatic. So you're not going to use this word if it's not emphatic, but it means things like it, like they, same, such, there, them, these, they, those, which, who, who, with all ye, right? So it's just putting emphasis upon this word times. Now the word times, um, 6256, right? This is it, time especially now, right? So now it could say, it could mean, you know, just really an emphatic now, you know, with an exclamation mark. There shall many stand up against the king of the south. But of course, the tense here um, is is future tense. So it shouldn't be now. It would be then, right? But in an emphatic sense. So this these many standing up against the king of the south were saying Macedon and um, Antiochus the third. But but also the robbers of thy people exalt themselves to establish the vision. Now, this idea of stand up um, has different meanings. A point, arise, cease, confirm, continue, dwell. Um, 
because it, it's literal and figurative and intransitively and transitively, right? So, so lots of different meanings of what it can be. But the robbers of thy people exalt themselves to establish the vision. Um, again, this e- exalting of themselves um, has lots of different meanings. It's also uh, literally or figuratively and absolutely and relatively, right? So uh, has lots of different ways in which it's it's translated. So here we have, now when it comes to Macedon, we haven't really un- dealt with what Macedon is. So, so the king of the north has an ally, Macedon. Why? I mean, Macedon prophetically is a symbol. What does it refer to? So Macedon was part of Greece. Right. So we look at it as, well, part of Greece. It's a territory. It's also a, a separate kingdom. So, you know, so we could say it's part of the Greek empire. Um, but here it's, it's, it's separated, right? It's not part of uh, the Seleucid Empire. It's it's a separate country, right? Right. Right. That's yeah. So, um, so it's it's part of the world. Now we're saying the king of the north represents the United States. The king of the south, atheistic communism, but there is an ally. That comes along, Philip of Macedon, right? Um, now, and he's going to be, I can't remember which Philip he is, uh, which number, I'm going to have to look at that again. Um, but he's one of the Philips, right? It's a popular name with the kings of Macedon. Okay, and I'm just reading some quick involvement uh, or quick history here of their involvement in this war. Um, so Philip II um, acceded to the throne in 359, so that's much earlier. Um, and wasn't Alexander the Great a Macedonian as well? Yeah, yes, he was the son of Philip. Right. So 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 that's what we have there. So it's it's connected to Greece. I'm just trying to get to the history that we hear. So the conflict with Rome. Um, so you're going to have um, conflicts with Rome starting in 215 BC in the sec. Well, at the height of the Second Punic War with the Carthaginian Empire. So Carthage is is in North Africa. Uh, Roman authorities intercepted a ship off Calabria coast. Okay, so we're going to have Philip V. Um, and so you can see there's lots of players in here that aren't necessarily, uh, we don't normally think about. So, um, yeah, so they, these, so these, so the Aetolian League, and I'm not familiar with it, um, but so what is the Aetolian League? Do you know anything about that? You want? No, I don't. I don't know what the Aetolian League is. So it, it's some kind of group of nations, anyway, um, that that have uh, interest in in what's happening. Because they make a peace agreement with Philip V in 206 BC, so that's six years before. And the Roman Republic negotiated a treaty, treaty of, with them in 205 BC, ending the war and allowing the Macedonians to retain some captured settlements in Illyria. Although the Romans rejected the Aetolian request in 202 BC for Rome to declare war on Macedonia once again, the Roman Senate gave serious consideration to a similar offer made by Pergamon and his ally Rhodes in 201 BC. 
These states were concerned about Philip V's alliances with Antiochus III of the Seleucid Empire, which invaded the war-weary and financially exhausted Ptolemaic Empire in the Fifth Syrian War, right, from 202 to 195, as Philip captured Ptolemaic settlements in the Aegean Sea. Although Rome's envoys played a critical role in convincing Athens to join the anti-Macedonian alliance, with Pergamon and Rose in 200 BC. Um, the People's Assembly rejected the Roman Senate's proposal for a declaration of war on Macedonia. Meanwhile, Philip V conquered territories at the Hellespont and the Bosporus, as well as the Ptolemaic Samos, which led Rhodes to form an alliance with Pergamon Byzant Byzantinium. I don't know the name of that place. P Y Z I C U S Zikus and Chios against Macedonia. Despite Philip's nominal alliance with the Seleucid king, he lost the naval battle of Chios in 201 BC. Um, while Philip V was busy fighting Rome's Greek allies, Rome viewed this as an opportunity to punish this former ally of Hannibal uh, with a war that they hoped would supply a victory to require a few resources. Now, wasn't Hannibal, wasn't he a Carthaginian? Yes. Yeah. So he was, and, and Carthage lost to Rome in, in that battle with Hannibal. Uh, the Roman Senate demanded that Philip V cease hostilities against neighboring Greek powers and defer to an international arbitration committee for settling grievances. When, uh, the, the People's Assembly finally voted in approval of the Roman Senate's declaration of war in 200 BC and handled the ultimatum to Philip V, demanding that a tribunal assess the damages owed to Rhodes and Pergamum. The Macedonian king rejected it. So while you're having all of this stuff happening, the Second Macedonian War, this is during the time of Panea, right? So we're looking at this other history that's, that's paralleling this. Now, so the question is, if we're going to look at uh, this verse, that there shall many stand up against the king of the south, and we're including the king of Macedon here, but we're also in some ways, even though they're not, Rome is not attacking Egypt, it is in a sense standing up against Egypt, right? That is, it's, it's, it's making, it's seeking to control what's happening in Egypt to help control the region. So Rome is working through all of these different um, alliances to bring stability to the region so that they eventually can conquer this area, right? So they're not, they're not a major player, right? They're not the, the biggest power in that region at this time, uh, but they are, are stepping in to become that power. Now we know in 191 BC, they defeat what's what's the battle in 191 BC between Greece, Greece and Rome? Yeah, between Greece and Rome, the Battle of Thermopylae, right? Thermopylae, correct. So April 24th, 191 BC. That's part of the Roman Seleucid War, right? So all of these different wars are going on. It, it, so the Battle of Thermopylae was fought as part of the Roman Seleucid War, pitting forces of the Roman Republic led by Manius Asilus Glabrio against the Seleucid, Seleucid Aetolian army of Antiochus III. Right? So, so this Battle of Thermopylae, uh, what is one of its significance? What's one of the things that's significant about this battle? Beside the fact that the Battle of Thermopylae was also fought between Greece and Persia, that Thermopylae was a, a turning point in world history for both of these, for all three of these nations. Okay, yeah, so we, we have it dealing with Persia and Greece, right? You know, famous 300, right? Correct. Okay. Well, and that's true here, that Battle of Thermopylae becomes this turning point, this hinge. Now, you say it's a turning point. It's also the center of the 62 weeks. Correct. 
right? So we have these, these 62 weeks, which is, you know, 434 years. You cut that in half, it's 217 years. Right. 31, 217 years. And if you go back from 27 AD, you go back 217 years, it brings you to 191 BC. Right. So 27 AD minus 217 gives you 190, and then you have to add one, right? Because right. Because you subtracted. So it gives you 191 BC. And so, so this becomes uh, important, right? So we know that this is all leading up to Rome defeating Greece. So, so when Rome defeats Greece, well, why why are we marking this? Because because Greece is still going to be around for a while. But but this is this the first battle directly between Rome and Greece? No. No. So it's not. So what's the significance of? It? It's the battle where Rome established its, itself as the greater of the powers. Okay. Yeah. So, and um, the Aegean Sea. What's the Aegean Sea? Why Rome controls the Aegean Sea from this point? Because those that control the Aegean Sea. The Aegean. Okay. They, they control the economies. Right. And it also. The shipping. Yeah. Right. And it also becomes uh, allowing Rome to then invade Asia Minor. Right. Right. So so we don't really think much about sea battles nowadays, but controlling these waters, it's it's controlling access to trade. And it's also um, allowing uh, you have access to conquering all of the cities along the seacoast. Right? So if you can sort of dominate with your fleets in that area, um, it's going to make it much more difficult uh, for for these states along the coast to defend themselves. Right. So this this is a major part of Rome ending up becoming the Roman Empire. OK. So so it's a turning point. It's it's the center of a chiasm. Now, when we think about the 70 weeks, we think of it primarily as, well, it's going to begin with the Persian Empire and it's going to end with the Roman Empire. Right? Correct. Okay. So so I think it's quite important that we can we can look at this that that this is all connected to Rome, so the Battle of, of Raphi and Paneum, all these different things, of course, dealing with Israel. But Rome coming in to establish the vision is an important at this point uh, because it, it helps, it gives the center point for the 62 weeks, right? Um, ultimately with this battle of Thermopylae. And so Rome coming in here at this time is coming in to establish the vision. It's going to now dominate um, that area and, and eventually be the one that comes against the, the Prince of Princes. So it's all very important details in, in understanding this, this prophecy. So, so when we get back here, so I, I just wanted to, so I think when it talks about those times, right, this emphatic word, those times, and I, and I still hadn't finished that. And I'm going to come back and finish that on Sunday because we're just not going to have time to go through that. Um, but we're going to analyze some of the numbers in these sections, right, some of the, uh, the Hebrew definition numbers. Um, any any final questions or any comments as we because we're not finished verse fifteen yet.
but we will fit, try to finish that on Sunday. And, and we'll try to finish off this. What I want to do next week is kind of get this line sort of established a little better all the way up to April 5th, 2030. Um, and see what this line is, how it looks as a line. <clears throat> You know, and once we get that done, then we enter into pagan Rome, right? The pagan Rome is going to come against Antiochus IV. So Antiochus IV is going to be in here, but that's going to be the history that Miller would connect to as far as understanding the 666 years, right? Which is, again, another important symbol. Okay. And any thoughts? Because we can close with prayer now. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the time that we've had to study here uh, this morning. We ask for your spirit to continue to be with us in the studies coming up uh, tomorrow night. Um, and then the studies on Sabbath uh, beginning at 9 a.m. Mountain, Mountain Standard Time. Uh, Sabbath school and church. And um, we pray, Lord, for the people around the world who are studying uh, these messages and seeking for light. We know, Lord, that we understand little, and we pray that um, you can continue to teach us and guide us. We ask for your angels' care and protection, and uh, we pray for one another. We know that... uh, We have very many difficulties in life, where we live, our associations, um, jobs, um, sometimes just providing for basic needs, and sometimes health situations. And we know, Lord, that all of these things that happen to us are for your glory. Help us to to recognize um, your hand in everything that happens to us. Be with each person. May your Holy Spirit continue to work in their lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.